Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing kiss and run fusion. So we've seen how um, synaptic vesicles have a very high proton concentration within them. Uh, and this is because of the work of the vesicular ATPase here, which is pumping continuously protons in. And the physiological purpose of this high proton concentration in the synaptic vesicle is uh, so that we can use that proton gradient to then uh, move the neurotransmitter into the synaptic vesicle by a secondary active transport mechanism. Okay, right. Now, when we put in our synaptofluorin protein, which is this modified chimera of synaptobrevin 2 with a green fluorescence protein, basically, this protein is dependent upon the pH. So when the pH is very low, Remember, PA, a low pH corresponds to a high proton concentration. So, um, when the pH is low, okay, low down, um, the, uh, pro that means that the proton concentration is very, very high. It means that you're acidic, basically. And that's because pH is the negative logarithm of uh, the proton concentration. Okay. Right, so, um, if you have a very, very big proton concentration, then the logarithm uh, is larger, okay? Um, because if I draw the log, the, let me just draw the log graph. Okay, so the logarithm graph looks kind of like this. It's only defined for positive numbers, at least in real analysis, it's only defined for positive numbers. It's defined for uh, negative numbers in complex analysis, but we won't go there. Um, okay, so the logarithm graph is only defined for the real num positive real numbers, but that doesn't bother us because you can't have a negative proton concentration anyway. Um, and as you can see, as you get a higher proton concentration, so if this is proton concentration, on the x-axis here, then the logarithm also goes up. Okay, so uh, basically, if proton concentration goes up, the logarithm goes up. So that means that if we take the negative of this graph, negative logarithm, then what we'll have is a graph that looks like this, effectively. Okay, so as the proton concentration gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the pH, so this is now pH on the x-axis, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Oh, sorry, pH on the y-axis. It gets smaller and smaller as the proton concentration gets bigger. Because it's just the uh, negative of this graph. You just spin it in the x-axis. Right. Uh, so everything just goes to the uh, negative of what it was being sent to. Right. OK. Uh, so you have a very low pH in this uh, synaptic vesicle. And that basically stops synaptofluorin from being a fluorophore. So what is a fluorophore? Well, let's take green fluorescence protein as the example for fluorophore. A fluorophore, really, the simplest definition is that a fluorophore is a molecule which can absorb radiation of a certain frequency. So nu is this Greek letter for frequency. So it needs to receive electromagnetic radiation of a certain frequency in order to excite it, the so-called uh, excitation, EX, frequency, so it receives in this energy uh, in the form of this excitation photon here, and then when it absorbs that photon, what it can do is it will now have an increased energy, so it will gain the energy from that photon, and what it can do is re-radiate that energy out at a different frequency of electromagnetic radiation, so it will give out another photon, and this is known as the emission frequency of that photon. And base, uh, well, this is known as the emission frequency of the fluorophore. Okay, and basically, uh, the emission frequency will always be smaller than the excitation frequency. So, you can send in one frequency of light, and you'll get out a different frequency of light. That is the phenomenon of fluorescence, basically. And by the way, when I say light, I mean electromagnetic radiation. I don't specifically mean visible light. Okay, uh, so often you have to set excite it with, um, with UV radiation, i.e. not visible radiation, higher frequency than visible radiation, uh, and you'll get out visible radiation. That's why it's called green fluorescence protein, because it's going to give out green light. So this is going to be within the green frequency, and this is generally in the UV frequency, the ultraviolet frequency. Okay, right. So, 
What do I mean by fluorescence quenching in the presence of a high proton concentration? So if you've got very high proton concentration in this vesicle, it can alter the fluorescent properties of the green fluorescence protein, and it can stop it from doing this. So now, if you fire UV at your, um, at your axon terminal, what are you going to see? Well, all of the synaptofluorins are within these vesicles. So are they going to take part in this fluorescence? Are you going to get green light coming back at you? Not much is the answer because they're all being quenched. So that's this fancy word for stopping the fluorescence happening. They're all being quenched by the high proton concentrations. The high proton concentration is stopping them from doing this. Okay, so um, basically you won't get much green light back out. Okay, right. So, uh, what we're going to do then is we're going to use this to image uh, the fusion event because when this vesicle fuses with the membrane, what will happen? The protons will be allowed to leave. Um, they'll be allowed to leave the vesicle, okay? And therefore, what you'll get is a lower proton concentration here. And that will lead to an increase in the fluorescence of the green fluorescence protein or the synaptofluorin proteins. And then you'll be able to see the fusion event by an increase in the fluorescence within these vesicles, which will indicate the reduction in proton concentration. Now, how do you see this at such a tiny scale? Well, what you have to use is total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. So let's go over the other page and see what total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy is. So basically, what you will do is you'll put your axon terminal, like so, with the docked synaptic vesicles on a glass plate, like so. So you put your axon terminal here on a glass plate, which is here. Okay, so this is a glass plate that we've put our axon terminal here on. And it will have all of these docked synaptic vesicles here, which are filled with our synaptofluorin. Okay, and now what we will do is we will um, we'll start off with the unexcited neuron and then I'll tell you what happens when we excite the neuron to actually start releasing the neurotransmitter. So what we'll do is we will fire radiation at, um, at this glass plate here. So this will be uh, some sort of electromagnetic wave and it will have to be the right frequency in order to excite the synaptofluorin in the, um, in the uh, synaptic vesicles, okay? And what will happen is if we shine it in at the right angle, it will reflect off, so we'll get total internal reflection. Okay, so this is total internal reflection of the radiation. Okay, and now for reasons that I don't understand, I think it's to do with quantum tunneling and the continuation of the wave function past the glass plate. But basically, what you get is you get an evanescent wave. So some of the energy from these photons does not get reflected back off. Some energy is going to make it through into the tissue here. So you're going to get the movement of some energy into uh, our axon terminal here. And this movement of energy into the tissue is what's known as an evanescent wave. So this is an evanescent wave. Okay, right. Now, the evanescent wave does not get far. It propagates for a while and then, well, it doesn't get further than a certain distance. So it gets around 300 nanometers, generally, which is not far at all. Not when you compare that to the diameter of a hydrogen atom. The diameter of a hydrogen atom is 0 0.1 nanometer, i.e. 1 angstrom. Um, so, um, when you think that this is only 3,000 hydrogen atoms stacked up, that's not that far. It's a very small distance, basically. Okay, so the energy is going to propagate into this small layer, basically, of the axon terminal here and not get any further. Now, what will happen is if these synaptofluorin proteins are not completely quenched by the high proton concentration, then they will absorb this energy from the evanescent wave, and then they will start re-emitting it as green light. Okay? So, what we can then do is we can put a camera... Uh, how do I draw a camera? Okay, we can put our camera here. 
an old-fashioned camera here. So we can put our camera here, and it can take a photo of the green light that is coming out. Now, what will it get, basically? Well, it's taking a photo, effectively, underneath here. So if we think about what we're going to get, here is our glass plate now. So we're looking at our glass plate from underneath. We've got our axon terminal blobbed on, okay? And here are all these vesicles that are docked at the synaptic membrane. Okay, right. Now, at the moment, we can't see them because all of the fluorescence properties of the synaptofluorin is quenched. Okay, so what we're now going to do is do the same experiment again, but we're going to excite this neuron. We're going to excite it. We're going to depolarize this membrane and get um, the neuron to release its uh, contents from its um, synaptic vesicles. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.